the animal kingdom, males are often presumed to be the most dominant. But are the biggest, baddest, and fiercest sharks in the ocean female? Oh! A beautiful big female great white shark came right under the boat here and surprised us. Tap into cutting edge research around the globe <laughs> and uncover what it takes to rule the waves. There are many differences between male and female sharks. One fascinating factor is their behavior. But could differences in both sex and behavior explain why some sharks attack? Now to the high alert at America's beaches. Lifeguards spotted a shark near swimmers about five feet from shore. In Mossel Bay, South Africa, Allison Towner is investigating the shark thought responsible for more human fatalities than any other, the great white. If there's ever a species of shark that you need to be extra cautious around, of course, it's a great white shark. Allison sets out to locate and tag a large female white shark here to reveal its movements and discover if females are more voracious than males. The largest male white sharks grow over 13 feet in length. But what about females? While both sexes can actually get really large, females have to be a lot bigger in order to reproduce. To see a mature female great white shark is an absolute spectacle. These animals get up to over 21 feet. I mean, they're weighing in at around two tons. Some of the biggest documented white sharks are pregnant females. They've got physiological demands on their body when they're pregnant. These enormous sharks must provide nutrients to sustain as many as 17 live young in utero, each measuring up to five feet long. This could mean that they're more hungry and that they're seeking out food at the coastal zones. Through active tracking with an acoustic transmitter, Allison can gain valuable insight into the movements of these mysterious females in real time. But first, she must tag one. Muscle Bay is a really important spot for white sharks, and that's primarily because it's effectively an aggregation site for their prey. We've got a seal colony with around 4,000 Cape Fur seals. Look at that. Predation over there. It's a shark taking a seal. The most amount of seals found in a white shark's stomach was six full Cape Fur seals, not pups, adults. We think it literally went around the island, chomping seal after seal after seal. We didn't realize they were capable of eating that much all in one sitting. Could bouts of intense feeding like this relate to females bulking up before pupping? I'm also by port control, also by port control. Well, we've just arrived at Seal Island. We're gonna get some chum slick going into the water so that we can get a white shark to the boat. Then we can get a tag in. These sharks may have the best sense of smell of any shark species. Female great white sharks, what I like to call the big girls, Often, a lot of the other white sharks around the boat will just scatter, and the big girls will kind of take over the show. These supreme predators rely on the art of ambush. In the moments before an attack, great white sharks can swim in bursts of over 20 feet per second. It isn't long before the first shark appears. Oh! It's a large female. Yeah, it comes deep, deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah, yeah. could be exactly what Allison is looking for. must wait for the ideal moment to deploy the tracking device. Oh! Oh! Absolutely 
absolutely unbelievable. We have a shark that's literally launched itself out of the water three times in a row, to the point that we can't tag this animal. The shark will not stay in one place long enough to deploy. Coming back again. OK, here we go. Oh! Tagging a shark this unpredictable is too dangerous for both Allison and the shark. It is far too difficult, but that's science for you. You know, it's full of surprises, and white sharks all have their own personalities. Personality in animals is a pioneering area of research, and a team of scientists are on a mission to understand the mind of the shark. Rising abruptly from the depths of the Indian Ocean, 600 miles from the nearest landmass, this is the lonely coral atoll of Fuvamula. The fishermen here have swept fish blood and guts into the water for generations. Inadvertently, they are calling a formidable predator up from the deep. Dr. Thomas Veneau is a shark behavior expert specializing in the personality of bull sharks. Now he is preparing to meet another equally feared species, the tiger shark. There is nowhere else in the world where you can get this close to tigers so easily, in very shallow water, very close to the shore, just a few meters away. Thomas hopes to use these unique conditions to assess the personalities of the local sharks. Males will usually have a bit more energy and move around faster. That's also more skinny and a little bit more cautious. But females are usually very confident and bold. They get a lot closer. So I know for a fact that there are shark personalities. But it's really hard to translate that knowledge into science. You have to translate it into measurements over years and years. This is the really hard part. Thomas's hypothesis is that every shark has its own very specific personality. If his theory is correct, it could be a sign of intelligence, which might evolve our perception of sharks. I think there is a big storm coming in. It's pretty wavy. I hope the visibility is OK. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to see the sharks well. It might get a little bit dangerous. If female personalities are different from males, could this research then shed light on the profile of a shark that attacks? George Burgess is a shark attack expert studying human-shark conflict. The three species of sharks that are most dangerous to humans are white sharks, bull sharks, and tiger sharks. The big three probably represent about 80% of fatal attacks recorded in the international shark attack file. If you wanted to develop a profile of a killer shark, you'd start with size. Size, of course, is the most important thing. The shark has to be big enough to cause real damage. And generally speaking, females tend to grow to a larger size than do males. With their physical superiority, could large female sharks be more dominant and possibly more aggressive than males? Thomas intends to find out. He follows the reef towards the edge. From here, the ocean floor drops away to a depth of over 16,000 feet. It's from this abyss that the sharks come. The tiger sharks begin to arrive but are they males or females, which can grow up to 18 feet long? Known to have one of the broadest diets of any shark species, the tiger has a reputation as a scavenger that will eat almost anything. Claspers, the male reproductive organs, differentiate the sexes. The males scatter. A 
much larger shark has arrived. A 14-foot-long female is on the scene. She swallows the entire tuna head in one effortless bite. This female is at the front of the dinner line. Thomas already sees similarities between his work with bull sharks and the tiger sharks here. But what about identifying different personalities of both male and female sharks? I've been very privileged to spend over a thousand hours with bull sharks in Fiji. And it's been a great opportunity for me to learn more about their behavior or their personalities. You can really assess which one is dominant and which ones are a little bit less likely to go into a fight. Dominant female bull sharks seem to behave in a similar way to tiger sharks. This is Ninja. It's one of my favorite bull sharks. Really impressive female, extremely smart, so agile, very skillful. Those big females really have a, a presence, something very special about them. They are by far the most dominant. Like the large female tiger, it appears females of both species can show dominance over males. Now, he'll evaluate the personalities of these tiger sharks and form a database. Using a numerical scale, he'll score the tiger shark's behavior, rating their confidence from safe to potentially dangerous to humans. I use it to write down the different behavior I see in different situations. For example, if a shark is coming to eat a fish head, it's one situation. If a shark is coming towards me, a human being, it's a different situation. Using an ethogram, Thomas reviews the personalities of the sharks, giving them a score from one to 10. One being very shy, 10, extremely bold. If I take the average of all the situation, can that give me an idea of how bold, how shy the shark is overall? Then I can compare this shark to the others. said the females are scoring higher than the males. When you spend thousands of hours with the same sharks in the water, you really get to know them so well that you can really predict what they're gonna do a few seconds before. You really develop a special relationship with them. It's amazing. Rating behavior over extended periods of time identifies the average behavior of each shark. This can demonstrate unique individual personalities. And if sharks do have different personalities, could this be the product of their experience, their environment, or could it be their genetics? Hey, Thomas! Eric! <laughs> nice to see you. Thomas is joined by Professor Eric Klua and his assistant, Clementine Segui. Eric is a marine biologist specializing in shark behavioral ecology and human-shark conflict. I'm focusing, you know, on better understanding shark behavior. Eric's compelling theory could explain attacks on people. If you accept the hypothesis that shark have personalities, it means that every shark will be different one from each other. Most sharks will never dare attacking a human, but you may have some very few scarce dysfunctional animals that will do it, and we call them problem individuals. Problem individuals are sharks which display a very particular type of behavior. Some sharks can attack humans more than others, particularly if these animals are very curious and inquisitive. 99.9% .9 of the population will never attack a human, but then you will have one that will do it, and repeatedly. Tonight, danger in the surf, lifeguards on shark patrol. Like Thomas, Eric's problem individual theory relies on demonstrating that sharks do indeed have individual personalities. 
meaning some might be shy, while others are bold, and that this individual behavior is consistent throughout the shark's life. I have also to prove that the personality trait is transmitted from one generation to another one, that a young shark, which is bold, will have either a mother or the father that is also bold. Eric must establish the lineage of these sharks through genetic analysis using DNA sampling. If successful, he may be able to identify potential problem individuals in a population. We are trying to use less intrusive tools to get DNA from the sharks. So usually we were shooting the sharks, you know, with a biopsy probe, but we're going to try getting DNA through the saliva of the shark. Eric hopes that a shark will bite the tuna head leaving behind a tooth mark, which may be swabbed for traces of the shark's DNA. I am hoping that the shark will have to struggle to bite and cut the head, and hopefully it will leave its DNA. The team head out of Fuvamula Harbor to search for the sharks, and they don't have far to go. That is a big one. That is a big one. Thomas coordinates topside while Eric and Clementine prepare to get up close and personal. Ready to meet tiger sharks? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Hey Eric, can you hear me? How's it going down there? activity down there. Just as things are getting busy below, the team on deck throw in the tuna head. Even underwater, traces of genetic material from the shark's mouth will remain on the rope, providing invaluable DNA for the scientists. Yes, that, that piece, that piece is okay. That's well, very good, amazing. Some of these sharks are really well marked on the dorsal fin, so we can recognize them quite well. Very impressive, very exciting to see these large animals coming from nowhere. The females are taking over the show. A big female came. She was bolder, actually, than the others. She came, she took it, but then she left a nice piece of saliva on the rock. Very good, but it worked. We have photo of all of these sharks. We have the behavior of all of these sharks. And so we will be able to link pictures and behavior with DNA. And that's really interesting because if some sharks by sharing the same behavior and the same DNA, we will know that they will be related, and that's a new discovery for us. We can better understand this link, potential link between behavior and genetics. To identify a relationship between genetics and personality, Eric and Clementine must use every chance they have to collect more samples. Back at base, Thomas reviews the day's activities to further develop his understanding of the tiger shark's personalities. Two sharks are going for the food. This one is just swimming off. 
he's giving up straight away. Yeah. The shark is pushing the rock, even biting to move the rocks away to get access to the food. It's impressive behavior. It's amazing. Ah, I love this shark. She, she's so gentle, you know, only a few hours with her and you can already feel her personality. Look at all those sharks. It's really great group dynamics. You can see the smaller ones that are a little bit more away, but the big ones are dominating the central space. Well, actually, I would feel very safe too, you know, if I was a four meter long shark. <laughs> True, me too. This is such a cool place. So many sharks in just one dive, so many displays of different personalities. I mean, this is great. In Maso Bay, Allison is still waiting for an opportunity to tag a female white shark. Keep on going. Yep. The team set out to try a new area away from Seal Island. Sharks are known to patrol the reef here, closer to shore. All right, Justin, neutral. With fewer seals around, it's possible that the sharks are less frenzied, making them easier to tag. and must act fast, choosing our moment. We've got a beautiful, big female great white shark that's just arrived. She came right under the boat here and surprised us. And then I'm just going to try and stick the transmitter right next to her fin. stars you needed to come past perfectly at the right time with the dorsal out of the water okay 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 here we go here we go yes it's in Woo! allison attaches the tag to the shark's dorsal fin a huge success for the expedition even though it looks a little bit invasive deploying these tags they heal very quickly. Flesh wounds are common in sharks, especially in females, whose skin grows up to twice as thick as the males, protecting them from bites inflicted during mating. So active tracking is almost like you're in the mind of the shark. You actually get such a feel for what the shark's doing naturally. You're in their world. Now, the team must track the shark's signal to try to find out where, and possibly what, she is hunting. Very weak signal. I just thought maybe I was getting a ping from down here, and it would have made sense that she beelined inshore. We spent so much time trying to get that tag on that shark, and we just couldn't get to her soon enough to, to get a track. With no time to waste, the team set out on a mission to find the tagged female shark. With an abundance of prey across the bay, this shark could be anywhere. The white shark, which generally prefers cooler waters, tends to go after sea mammals, considering they have to come to the surface to breathe. If you're a predator, the perfect time to get one of those animals is when their head's sticking out of the water. Investigative bites have been demonstrated in the white shark in particular. A quick try to grab something at the water surface to determine what it is, whether it's edible or not. It's acting like the right kind of thing. It's the right size, and I'm hungry. Both mistaken identity and investigative bites could account for a proportion of attacks every year. But Eric has another theory. There was the case of a tiger shark in Papua New Guinea that perpetrated up to 12 attacks on humans. Without knowing the gender of the animal, people called that animal big boy. In lots of cases after an attack, the gender of the shark is not known. 
but I have the strong feeling that in most cases, females are responsible for these attacks. Given the size of this shark, instead of calling him big boy, they should have called her big girl. In the year 2021, the International Shark Attack File reported 73 incidents of unprovoked shark attack worldwide, resulting in a very high number of deaths. But we have essentially no information at all on the sex of attacking sharks on humans. But an attack by a larger animal, which would more likely be a female, is likely to cause greater damage or greater harm. Could these monstrous females be more confident due to their superior size? making them more likely to attack? The team hopes to collect the genetic material of such a shark. A bold 14-foot-long female takes the bait. It is very important for us not only to get samples of DNA, but also to know who they belong to and to make the link between the personality and the genetics of the sharks. Eric sees a tooth fall from the large female's mouth. It holds the DNA the team is looking for. When you're surrounded by so many sharks, it's very difficult when you're underwater to make sure you can see 360 around you. Actually, it's, it's impossible. It is critical for Eric and Clementine to work together, watching each other's backs as they look out for the tooth. You should not allow a shark to come into the group because then you are in trouble. These animals, they have an amazing pressure in their jaw. It's about half a ton per square centimeters. You can imagine these teeth, the damage they can do. I prefer that not to happen to me. Eric is determined to find the tiger shark tooth. and very bold, you know? One of the shark had to struggle to get the head and I saw one tooth falling out and I was able to retrieve. That tooth is from the first large female I came and grabbed, you know, the tuna head. This tooth will be sent back to the lab for analysis. Could she be related to the shark that bit through the rope? With Thomas's ongoing ethogram studies and Eric and Clementine's genetic approach combined, the team in Fuvamula are gaining unique insight into the sharks here. This multidisciplinary study could potentially hold the secret to identifying what it takes to be a problem individual. Whether problem shark or not, when it comes to finding the queen of the waves, Allison's theory is simple. Size rules. She firmly believes there is a direct correlation between size and dominance. One thing I've observed with great white sharks, if a large female comes on the scene and there are other smaller white sharks around her, they move out of the way. And it's almost like she's aware of her own presence and power as well. So certainly the females assert their dominance and it's absolutely spectacular to see. These supersized females are the largest predatory fish in the ocean. Could they be defending a nursery to protect their young? Would a mother shark be more aggressive? Um, not that we know of. There's absolutely no mother nurturing when it comes to delivering pups as white sharks. When they drop their pups, off the pups go, fully self-sufficient. Nobody has ever seen or documented great white sharks giving birth or mating anywhere on the planet. It's like the holy grail. But what about pregnant sharks? Could they be more aggressive? Thomas is keen to track one down to assess its personality and find out.
Suddenly, the sharks swim away. Has something scared them off? A 14-foot-long tiger shark emerges from the deep, one of the largest of the expedition so far. And she's pregnant. Female tigers can carry more than 30 pups. This encounter is short-lived, and before Thomas has a chance to assess her personality, she melts into the shadows. Although bold, it seems this mother-to-be is not so voracious after all. It's uh, pretty well understood that pregnant females, when they're in the areas where they're birthing, are not feeding. We've seen time and time again where female sharks that are pregnant and getting ready to give birth ignore humans completely. I'm unaware of any attack that has ever occurred with a pregnant shark. One scientific theory is that possibly they have hormones in the late term of their pregnancy that inhibit them feeding to prevent them from preying on their own young. Could it be that a large female white shark that's just given birth and is now seeking prey may be sort of less selective on what she's eating? Difficult to support, but certainly something to consider. Look, if you told me I wasn't eating for the last term of my pregnancy and I gave birth, I would be seriously angry at the end of that, and I'd certainly be looking for a meal. Allison continues the search for the tagged shark. She's very far away, but I think I'm starting to get some pings. Phones, and we're going to see if we can get a directional track on her so that we can get positions and follow her around. We know she's within 500 meters of the boat somewhere. Allison moves quickly to get a bearing on the shark before she loses signal again. Yeah, she's over here. So I want a clock, but if we don't go, we're going to lose her. It's good. The team are just over half a mile from the shore. Who knew that she'd be down here, all this way from where we saw her? One thing I love about these female sharks is that they're just so unpredictable. One is not exactly really like the other, so they constantly keep you on your toes. OK, she's over there now. OK, let's go neutral. 22. Yes. Zero 07. 511. It's like the ultimate game of hide and seek with a great white, isn't it? Allison continues the hunt. Even with a tag, finding a single shark in the ocean is far from easy. So when it comes to attacks, finding the perpetrator is extremely difficult. Most sharks that are biting humans are gone after they bite. Danger in the surf. We have virtually no confidence in the identification of a shark or its size for most victims. I'm aware of three different times where an individual shark could be documented or hypothesized as attacking more than once within a short period of time. That's out of thousands that we've documented. But Eric is on the trail of one shark, which he believes is a repeat offender. In December 2020, there was a fatal attack in San Martin. And one month later, there was a second attack, which was almost fatal. These two attacks happened only 85 kilometers from each other. This is in an area where there have been no fatal attacks in recent history. But are these two incidents linked? We were able to prove that it was a tiger shark. And now we have ongoing genetic analysis 
that should allow us to prove that actually it is the same individual. The techniques Eric is employing in the Caribbean could one day expose soon to be problem sharks. The central question is why a shark will bite a human being? But actually, it's not the right question. The right question will be why that shark beat a human being? What makes that shark different from the other sharks? To understand that, we have to take the different components of shark behavior. Dominance will, of course, be directly linked to the size of the shark, but personality will also play a critical role for that dominance. We want to identify the dominant animals that they participate directly to, to the feeding frenzy. Stay safe, OK? To identify the dominance hierarchy in this group of sharks, the team must collect the DNA of the boldest individual at the top of the pecking order. This yellow fin tuna weighs 200 pounds and is a substantial prize to claim. Standing down the tuna. The shark that comes in to take this tuna could well rule the waves here. The team don't have to wait long before they have a contender. found a dominant shark. But with no genetic material collected this time, there is still a lot to learn about her. All the sharks, they move away. They let the queen come to the bait. She definitely rules the sharks. She is enormous. She is confident. She is female. But do these factors make similar sharks more likely to become problem individuals? They need to be bold, but that's not even enough to feed on a human. You also need positive reinforcement through your own experience. A bolder shark could be more likely to experiment with larger, riskier prey items. If unharmed and rewarded with a meal, it is conditioned through this experience to keep trying larger prey. But if the animal does not have a positive experience and is hurt or frightened, it may think twice before trying again. Thomas believes that using this principle could mitigate against problem sharks. When I work with bull sharks, I have this special sound I use to scare them, to do negative reinforcement, teach them this is not something I want you to do. I was using a variant of the Doppler effects so you feel like something is going after you really fast, even though I'm not moving. It works with bull shark, but it doesn't seem to work with tigers. I've tried many occasions in Fuvamula, and because tiger sharks evolve to be more vision and smell, maybe they don't react to sound as much. 
whether or not conditioning sharks works as a deterrent. Perhaps shark personality should be given more consideration when it comes to human-shark conflict. I don't like the mistaken identity concept because it means that all the sharks around the world could make a mistake. All sharks potentially represent a danger. On the contrary, 99.9% .9 of sharks will never represent a real danger for people. Only 0.01 may represent a danger, and these are the problem individuals. If sharks do have individual heritable personalities, might this change our approach to shark attacks? Still, the main strategy to manage human fatalities is to curl sharks blindly without any selectivity. If we manage to prove that the hypothesis of the problem individual is true, it means we don't have a problem with sharks. We have just a problem with very few individuals. Sharks are sentient beings, and they deserve respect as much as any other animals. They absolutely have their own personalities, and I think that is such a fascinating trait. It shows they also have thoughts and maybe emotions. Do sharks have feelings? I imagine they do feel pain, but if they got the emotional complexity that we human beings tie to feelings, that's a whole different level of science, but you never know. Can you believe it? It's her! Look at this! She is a good kilometre and a half away from where we tagged her. So close to shore, you can actually see a bunch of people on the beach, and this animal is just doing what it does naturally. It's patrolling the reef here. If they knew what we were tracking right behind the surf here, just goes to show coexistence is ultimately possible. In fact, it happens more than we know it. Eric and Clementine must wait for the results of their ongoing genetic analyses, which they hope will prove that personality is inherited and support their problem individual theory. My dream is to understand better the behavior of sharks to improve the relationships between humans and these animals. Sharks are not the man that we think they are. As a new generation of marine biologists, it's up to us to protect sharks for generations to come. Because of the millions of years of evolution, females have grown so much stronger, so much more resistant than males. In the world of sharks, the rulers are the queen and not the king. Their skin is thicker than the males. They grow larger than the males. They live longer than the males. And they outnumber the males. The females are 100% dominant. Here in Fuvamula, we definitely met a shark queen. I hope that she and her fellow queens will continue to rule our oceans for the many years to come. Long live the queen. <laughs>